30. Januar sind in Deutschland die Würfel gefallen. Und ich glaube nicht, dass die Gegner, die damals noch gelacht haben, heute auch noch lachen. Well, we're doing a series, let me start this, sorry. There we go. We're doing a series on five, six, seven lessons we can learn from Nazi Germany. Uh, why? Because we think we're heading into the most unprecedented time of persecution for Christians. Uh, whether or not it's prophetic in that stage, we probably think it is, but even if you don't, we are heading into a time of persecution for Christians. Uh, how do you know? <laughs> many, many things, but even in the last two weeks, were they blaming domestic violence on uh, evangelical Christians who um, you know, were supposed to be causing our wives to submit? Good luck with that. But, you know, we're supposed to be f making that happen and uh, either beating them into submission is what we're supposed to be doing. I, I invite you to go to any, anyone out there. Go to a women's shelter. Have a look at the women that are in there and count how many are from evangelical Christian homes. I'm not talking about wacky Christians, I'm talking about people who believe the Bible and believe that if there's any submission, as in our lives being submitted to God, it's through love that we submit. It's not uh, a forced submission, that's called slavery. And so no one's forcing anybody to do anything. Uh, but they are telling us that this is what it was. The ABC, it's the longest article I've ever read on the ABC News report. I get my news from there and, you know, you click into the little eye thing and you go down. Mate, on that article, you went down and down and down and down. It was like never ending. Can you be a Christian and, uh, and uh, be against domestic violence? All these things going on and on and on. Now, it took Andrew Bolt to come out and say, look, these are the real statistics. You're just plain telling lies about Christianity. And, you know, the, in Media Watch, uh, the guy on there, what was his reply? His reply was basically, well, Andrew point, he had a point. That's all he said. They never retracted their article. They never explained that they were telling lies with their statistics. They never said that. They just defamed Christianity and no apology, just he has a point as in Bolt was telling all the statistics that it's just a crock, but they, I mean, man, can you imagine doing that with Islam? Mm. Hey, my goodness, there'd be death threats at the ABC. Anyway, if you don't think we're living in an apostate age, I invite you to look at yesterday's news where you had a, one of the um, uh, Anglican bishops from Brisbane who came out and began to um, say to the politicians, what are you doing when you're inv invited into this office? You're there, you're there to do this. And what was he calling for? He's calling for gay marriage. Right? You've got the church prodding the politicians going for gay marriage. I don't care if you're for gay marriage or you're not for gay marriage. It's clear from Romans 1 that the Bible is not for gay marriage. Okay? Whether you agree with it or not. So you think there's churches out there that have got a cross on the door. You've got a dog collar on the guy up the front. And they're uh, telling you they're Christian. Uh, Mate, there no, no Christian is calling for that. We love homosexuals. We want to see them saved. We want to see them helped. I mean, there, there is trauma that affects people that makes them uh, uh, question their gender or sexuality. Okay, that's, that's no problem with that. But what we're doing by accepting it is denying them any help to be restored to a normal mindset. Before 1980, it was a mental illness listed in the psychology handbook. It's been removed. Why? Because the homosexual lo lobby is badgering about it. Um, so we're living in an unprecedented age. I want you to imagine something. 2008, uh, Germans youth, Germany's youth welfare, so this is recent, 2008, less than 10 years ago, uh, Germany's youth welfare office and police officials surround the Gorbers family uh, Überlingen home, I've probably killed that, um, or Überlingen's home, uh, in a surprise raid. Surprise raid. Mr. Uh, Mr. Gorba was visiting his wife at the local hospital where she'd been admitted because of their pregnancy complications with their ninth child. Despite the children's repeated protests, all but the oldest son, age 21, and the daughter, age 20, were taken into custody by the authorities. Imagine that. Mum's in hospital, dad's out visiting, they do a raid on the home and take, take these kids away. What's their crime? They refused to send their children to the local public school, but instead chose to homeschool their children. What about Andre and 
I don't know how to pronounce this, Rita. F R A U K E. I can't spell it out, but when I say that, I can spell it. Yeah, pronounce that so I don't destroy your name. There, this one here. Frook. 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 Second one down there. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. Just Frook. Frook. Okay, there we go. Andre and Frook, and they've left the, uh, the um, surname off. They're a Christian family, and they're in Hamburg. They've suffered the same fate. Um, they chose to educate their children at home on the grounds they wanted to be obedient to the Lord and keep their influence of the public school system. Uh, in response, state officials promised, listen, and I quote this, apply the full power of the state until this family yielded to compulsory education laws. Uh, next, five officers, five officers arrested Andre, right? Mate, you can have, I had a woman, a client who was getting broken into and they couldn't get the police there. You know what I mean? But five officers turned up and arrested this bloke. Um, and uh, so next the officers showed up to forcibly escort the children to school. Can you imagine the distress of the children in this? In this uh, finally, the family lost custody of the children and they became wards of the state where no doubt the government did a wonderful job of bringing these children up in a loving environment slash sexual molestation occurring under the watch of the uh, Department of Child Services. They know about it, it's been investigated, but they leave them in these homes, okay? It's been, we've had them in the courts here. Okay, the family eventually fled to Austria um, in an RV to join other homeschoolers who have fled Germany so that they could homeschool their children. Uh, now, I'm not sure, I didn't check, but thinking back, I remember when Jazz and I were conceiving our children, I looked in the bed and I didn't think anyone else was in there. Okay, it was just the two of us, as far as I know. <laughs> then when it was born, as far as I know, we took the child home and had to raise these kids and it cost us a fortune. We did that. The government never did that. The question is, when a, when a, uh, a human being is born from your body, from your materials, who owns that child? Who owns that child? Because you'll either come to one or two conclusions. You'll say either God owns that child and then you have responsibility, sovereign you know, custody of that child and stewardship of that child. It's not your own. Your body's not your own. It's bought with a price. Is that right? So where children are on lend to us, okay, we don't have ownership of them, uh, but custody, stewardship, God gives to us. Or you'll have a different view where you say the state owns every child. And really, it's just your responsibility to do, uh, to do the upbringing or whatever. But really, the state owns that child. And there is a swinging balance in there. Because if you've got parents that are molesting their children, abusing their children, maybe the state does have to take custody where they forfeit their rights of stewardship. But let's recognise, firstly, that God gives stewardship to mum and dad, or mum or and or dad uh, in this day and age. You understand what I'm saying? But this is being supremely challenged. Uh, what we're talking about today is parents, not the state, are responsible for educating your system. Now, I'm not here to bang on about homeschooling. Uh, my, none of my kids have done homeschooling. But my thing is this. Who cares about homeschooling? Who cares about uh, you know, a laser fair sort of treatment of people who want to educate their kids that way. What we want at the end of the day is them to be able to sit a test and meet benchmarks of educational standards. And if they've got a different way of going about that, that's fine. But what we want is educated students at the end of the day. That's really, as a society, what we want, isn't it? We want every child to have the ability to read and write. And what have we got in, in compulsory state education? I've got a principal telling me from the local region that 30% of the kids that come out of high school, year 12, can't read to, for life education. Might, they might be able to text message and all this sort of stuff, but if you put a loan contract or a tenancy agreement in front of them, they can't read it. 30% of who they're graduating. So we're not talking about education standards here when the government talks in these terms about compulsory education. What does the German media portray? It portrays homeschoolers as... <laughs> as extreme fundamentalists. Okay, wacky doo-doos out there, right? We've got these wacky doo-doo Christians, they're extreme fundamentalists. More than that, they're dangerous, right? Us Christians, we're blooming dangerous. We don't see us doing bomb threat, threats to Stocklands. We don't see us blowing up bus terminals. But, mate, we're dangerous to society is what we are. Okay, 
And what they paint us as is extreme fundamentalists or cults, belonging to cults. You would have seen the, the, the report on the uh, independent Baptist movement maybe in 60 minutes. Okay, I know many and many of those children. Can I say that family is obviously stuffed up? I mean, the wife has been raped by the husband, no question about that. We don't force ourselves on anybody. Uh, so that's absolutely, she's a victim. Uh, she's probably done the wrong thing taking it to the media, but then she's painted the whole independent Baptist movement as being a cult. Well, mate, I know a lot of people in there, where were they when they were dropping meals off at the ends of the floods? Where were they when they go to hospital visitation? Where were they when they're helping the handicapped come through? You know, where are they for any of that stuff? They don't know about that. They get some wacky doodle family out there that's been mistreated. I'm not trying to minimise what's happened in their thing, but don't overlay what's happened to you over the whole movement, okay? they got solid uh, found a theological uh, basis from what I've read of their statement of faith. I don't agree with all of it, but, you know... So, what are they doing? They've got laws that make education in public schools compulsory, and they have historically always been found in the most totalitarian of governments where state-sponsored indoctrination was a major goal of the education system. That's really what's going on. Communist countries, China, Russia, always had state education. That was the only education that was there. Why? Because we need to indoctrinate them in the way of the state. That's what's going on. Okay. So we, we probably don't have any basis. I mean, homeschooling is still free and legal, as is private education, Christian schools and things along those lines. It's still free and easy in this country, but there's no reason to believe that that may remain the case uh, because many countries are turning on Christianity and that's certainly one of the ways they want to purge society of us fundamental bigots because we won't conform with their picture of the new world. Um, but they keep touting on about freedom of speech, freedom, and I have no problem with people disagreeing with everything I'm saying. No problem with that. And I stand up for your right to say it. But all I'm asking is that you allow me the same freedom. That's all we're asking, okay? 1938, what did Hitler do? So we're not talking about war years, but leading up to what led to these war years. In 1938, Hitler abolished all homeschooling, making it illegal. Illegal. Hitler understood the value of educating a child. I want to quote him here. He says this, The youth of today is ever the people of tomorrow. For this reason, we have set before ourselves the task of inoculating our youth. And everyone understand the term inoculation. It's like vaccination. Putting a little bit in just so that it infects the whole system. Inoculating it with the spirit of this community of the people at a very early age, at an age where human beings are still unperverted and therefore unspoiled. The Reich, this Reich stands and is building itself for the future upon its youth. And this new Reich will give its youth its own education, its own upbringing. And you wonder why our education systems are being changed so much from what was in the past. Uh, Curriculum is being amended. To the parents, this is what Hitler said. You think the parents would be upset about this? This is what Hitler said to the parents. He calmly says this. He says, your child belongs to us already. He says, what are you? You will pass on. Your descendants, however, now stand in the new camp. In a short time, they will know nothing else but this new community. Hitler believed quite rightly that he who controls the youth controls the future. And my question is, who's controlling the education system and has been for the last 30 years, pumping all sorts of gender identity stuff in there, confusion, and we'll go a little bit into that as we go. Okay, so all faith-based schools were shut down. Under Hitler, he shut down all Christian schools. Gone. Faith-based, out of here. How were they shut down? Was it by a legal code or anything on those? No, he did it how we said before about the laws. He comes around and he says, Paul, you know what? That pulpit there, it's got sharp edges. We've got a new ordinance. We can't have sharp edges. We need desks with round edges because, you know, that is going to hurt somebody. Then you change round edges. Then they say, look, round edges, someone's going to slip off that. So we're going to have new things. So continually you have to run out of cash trying to keep up with all the ordinances. And as they change the laws, they put inspectors onto your property and they shut them down by those type of means. It was not by some public means of, you know, we're shutting you down. What it is is they're not... They they would announce publicly these schools are not fit for the code. You know, they don't meet our safety requirements. Do they meet them? They were making them so they couldn't meet them. Is that right? That's what they were doing. So um, that's how they did it. Hitler said, in effect, this is what he says, you have to raise the body of the child, but we will have its soul. That's what Hitler said. Uh, we will have its soul. He said the children belong to the Reich, 
That's the question that we start at the front. Either we believe that God entrusts us with our children and therefore we have freedom, or we believe that the state owns our children, in which case we have no freedom whatsoever, no say in how we bring up our children. Okay, state-sponsored indoctrination. Number one, children were subjected. What happened when Hitler took over these public schools? Well, he started producing films. Uh, got the, you know, the propaganda machine rolling. And what were the films showing? They were showing that Jews, of course, were subhuman. Okay, the Nazi philosophy that he was going on there, uh, and they were an unnecessary burden on society. He had showed films about Darwin's evolutionary theory. Okay, so uh, notions they were presented in the classroom to extol the virtues. Why? Because eugenics. He wanted the Aryan race to be exalted, and the evolutionary idea of survival of the fittest. Okay, those that are strongest survive. Uh, so, what was wrong with hurrying along the evolutionary process and culling out the weak? Uh, since only the fittest should survive anyway, um, Hitler asked this question. He said, why can't we be as cruel as nature? After all, it's an evolutionary process and surely those that are disabled or slightly thing, we just destroy them because it's an economic burden. And so textbooks were rewritten. When you went to school in Hitler's Germany, there were different textbooks that came out. Uh, they were rewritten to, to reflect the view of racial fitness. Okay, uh, The rationale for military expansion and the emph emphasis on German history and culture. Okay, So they were written in those ways. Uh, if teachers wanted to keep their jobs, uh, they had to swear a personal oath of loyalty to Hitler. And so by 1937, 97% of teachers were members of the National Socialist Teachers Union. Um, each teacher had to use official courses. Okay, sound national curriculum, sound anything like this? Official courses and textbooks prescribed by the Reich. You couldn't use anything outside that. It wasn't recognised. Okay. A history of documents and eyewitness accounts. This is a book, that's the name of the book, that was written by Jeremy Noakes and Geoffrey Pridham here. 30 pages of documents detailing how Nazism attempted to capture the heart of the youth. Hitler couldn't have been clearer. This is what he said, and I quote here. The German youth must no longer be confronted with the choice of whether they wish to grow up in a spirit of materialism or idealism or racism or internationalism or religious or godlessness, but they must be consciously shaped according to the principles which are recognised as correct, according to the principles of National Socialism. Understand what they're saying. We must no longer have a choice for our kids, we just present the views of National Socialism. That's what he did with the, the education system. We no longer try and make them think and present different models of how society might be run, whether it's anarchy, oligarchy, monarchy, democracy, whatever. We don't present... What we do is National Socialism, that's the way, and that's how he ran it. So we run them down one course with maybe tainting the other ones along the way so that you, you run them down that one funnel. The purpose of school was not for independent thought. That was the old thing, wasn't it? Teach your child to think and then they can think for themselves. No one's running, ramming anyone into Christianity. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. It says, come let us reason together. Don't park your brain at the door and sign up for Christianity. Engage your brain and let God reason with you and you'll find there's, there's, there's things to be learned in there. So the purpose of school is not that teaching our, our children to think in a rational th framework, but rather to transform the attitude. This is the purpose of education in this society, to transform the attitude and values of children to conform to what the state wants. That's what they're doing. This is what the Munich professors... Hitler uh, sent one of his emissaries to the Munich professors, and this is what he said to them. He said this, From now on, these are professors, high, more highly qualified than he was. He said this to them, From now on, it's not up to you to decide what's truth, but whether it is in the interest of the National Socialist Revolution. So you don't have to just try and decide what's true and go, go through that. You just push them down that load. If it's not in the interest of that, it's not truth. Okay, so truth was what? Truth was whatever the Nazi party wanted it to be. That's what it was. And so um, that's how Hitler was going. Children's values that were derived from their parents, they needed to be replaced with new values, okay? New values uh, that were taught in the classroom. Children had to understand that group think, what the collective thinks, 
Groupthink was more important than what the individual was. And these guys who wrote the book said this, the more enthusiastic they get, the easier the exams, and sooner they'll get a position and a job. The new generation has never had much use for education and reading. Now, nothing is demanded of them. On the contrary, knowledge is publicly condemned. If you're a study worm and a bookworm, you might be getting bullied at school. Why? Because, mate, it doesn't really matter. I mean, when I started going through, that's when they dropped off punctuation. Thank God for that, I said. I wasn't good at it anyway. You know, I'd write my exams and uh, I, I was probably all right at putting it all together, but where the comma goes and do you have the comma after the S or before the S, no idea. Thankfully, they dropped that off. So they dropped that out. Then it wasn't a strip where we didn't really have to spell properly. You just wrote a thing down and if you got the spelling right, but the feeling was right. They let that go through, oops, sorry, and they marked it on that regard. That's where they're going with education. It's not so much hammering the detail and getting everything right. It's getting the feeling right. It's getting the attitude right is where, we, where they're going with it. And so we end up with lots of group projects because the smart one in the group, group pulls all the dumb ones through. And that's how she runs. That's why university is the way it is because uh, they don't have a proper education and things are coming down levels. That's why when my OP score used to be fairly high, or, or we had TE scores, was high for my course. Now, if you've got a wallet and a heartbeat, you can get into my course. You know what I mean? They don't care. They'll let you through the door. But when they do that, they've got to lower all the standards to get everyone through because they get funding for the pass rates. Okay. Where are you? Oh, I've stopped that. Sorry. I don't know where we are. I need to put that somewhere else. Okay. So they need to derive this from the classroom. Students get asked open-ended questions. They need to confuse their values before they clarify these values. So what Hitler did, he would ask questions, open-ended questions to get answers. He'd say this sort of thing. If the construction, and I can just see the German mind ticking here with their efficiencies, they say this. If the construction of a lunatic asylum costs six million Reichmark, how many houses could you build for 15,000 Reichmark each? You understand what the goal of the question is. The goal of the question is to drain out all the sympathies that you might feel for the mentally ill and taking care of their needs and put economic and pragmatic views in place where we say, economically, it's not worth spending that amount of money. We just spend it on housing. More people get housed and we then just euthanize those that are mentally ill. So that's the sort of things that they would go in, um, in classrooms. So the goal of the course was to train the mind that way, to drain out the sympathies and things along those lines that were natural. They were natural in every people. The slogan was this, youth is to be led by youth. And mate, all the youth say, amen, is that right? Get out of the neck of these old buggers, you know what I mean? Get out from under that noose and you know, run, the, run the show yourself. That's, and listen, we've all been young, we may not look it, we've been young, we all felt the same way. Couldn't wait to get out of mum and dad's place. When we were out of mum and dad's place, we thought, thank God, freedom at last. You know, you have something in you that you want to run your own show, and that's natural to want to be independent. But when youth run the show without old heads, and you do stuff ups, okay? And I'm only telling you because I did them. You know what I mean? We've been there, we've done that. You run your own show, but you don't have the knowledge and experience to make a wise decision. You do have energy and enthusiasm, which can get you out of a lot of this stuff, but that's what you've got. So they had youth is to be led by youth, but really, at the end of the show, it was a false thing that was going on, because really, who was running the youth was the establishment was running the youth and telling them they had the power that youth should run the youth. What they were doing was making them rebellious, independent of authority and their parents so that they could mould their minds. That's what's going on. And you've got to wonder why some churches then have a, a, a whole basis of people when they get to 50, basically they've got to get out of those churches, they can't hack it anymore because the whole church is based on young people. And you're thinking, is that scriptural? When God says he puts the lonely in families, surely the family should be consistent and considerate enough to take into account those that are 80 and 70 within their congregations. But anyway, that's a different topic. So teachers were expected, what was expected of a teacher? A teacher was expected to create an optimistic climate inside the, the, 
the classroom. An optimistic, a happy, positive vibe. Get rid of the negatives and concentrate on the positives, okay? That's what we need to do. That's what they had to do. They had to, to do that and, uh, and they had to create an atmosphere of victory. You understand, even if everyone's failing in the classroom, we create an atmosphere of victory. Yes, Johnny picked his nose today. Woohoo! You know, Julia coloured between the lines. Woohoo! You know what I mean? Joe took his medication on time. Woo! So we make small things into big victories. Can I just say, when I went through school, I never got a lolly. I never got incentives. What the incentive was, was you get sent to the office. And you get sent to the office, you got the paddle on the backside. That was incentive enough for me. These days we've got lollies and we got whatever you got, got little stickers and cardboards and rulers. I see the tax returns for these teachers, the poor buggers, spending thousands of dollars on your kids and mine trying to get them carrot in front of the horse, you know, get them moving. Anyway, so this is the atmosphere that Hitler wanted, optimistic, atmosphere of victory, of confidence. We're building this child's confidence. Even if they're useless, I'm not trying to degrade children, but you need to put, you get worth from ability, is that right? But they're trying to put confidence and worth when they don't have the ability and they need to be taught this stuff, but they get promoted through. So, in my day, you used to have someone who didn't pass year two stayed in year two. Now, I've got teachers coming that have got grade eight and grade nine with people in there that are reading at year two. I mean, you're just crucifying that child and their ability to learn and be a functioning human being. Why? Because socially they want to fit in at year eight. But mentally, they're at year two. I mean, teach the child properly. Anyway, so they had to create this. Okay. Dr. Chester Pierce of Harvard University. Here, listen to this. This is the, th the theory that's coming out. We draw all our theories and our, our streams from the US, and so I'm going to concentrate on the US education system so we can see what's flowing down into our stream, okay? This is what he said. Dr. Chester Pierce of Harvard University. He addressed 2,000 uh, teachers in Denver, and he made a chilling assessment of the teacher's responsibility. And I quote, this is what he said. Every child in America who enters school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance towards our elected officials, towards our founding fathers, toward our institutions, toward the preservation of their form of government. Patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty, all that proves that children are sick because they truly well, the truly well individual is one who has rejected all of those things and is what I would call the true international child of the future. That's what they want, is global citizens. And therefore, that's the view. That's what they, they come to the mindset that you are sick. You take little Johnny along to the gate and you put him through in the hands of these two teachers. And I'm not saying every teacher's like this. There's great teachers out there that are trying to do their job properly. But at the top echelon, this is the rhetoric that's getting said. These children are sick and their minds need to be moulded so that they fit into a multicultural, a multi-gender society. And so we start tinkering with their minds to make that go there. We try to teach our, uh, they try to teach our ki kids what? A notion that there's no absolutes, is that right? No truth, no right, no wrong. There's nothing wrong. Um, they do this by affirming the following mantra. Personal value, personal value should be left up to each student. We can't measure value, it's whatever value they have, not dictated by their parents of the church. You know what I would have said to that when they, they said there's no absolutes and no right or wrong? I would have picked up a knife and put it at the, at the teacher's throat and I would have said, I'm going to now run this knife right through your jugular vein and you're going to bleed to death on the floor here. But there's no absolutes, it's not wrong. It can't be wrong, it, it feels right to me. I tell you what, she did then believe in absolutes at that time. It's wrong to kill, right? You know what I mean? They soon come up with some absolutes once you start pushing these theories. But anyway, they go on. Question, questions are used to solicit open-ended answers that teach each child that there are no absolutes. They run this, these, they, it's premeditated to open their mind to a, a world of no absolutes. How do they get there? They say these things. Would you favour a law that limits the size of, the fa of families to two children? I mean, that was China's, you know, two-child two family. 
or one child family they had. I mean, so it's no wrong, no right answer to that thing, is that right? Uh, you might feel that you're, you know, I come from a big family, I didn't, I come from a small family, so I'm happy with a big family. Maybe you come from a big family, you said, stuff that, I'm going to have one child, you know what I mean? Whatever you're going to do. What about this one? It says, do you think parents should teach their children to masturbate? And they do put sexual content into these things because they need to sexualise our children as well. What about this? Do you think sex education should include techniques for lovemaking and contraception? What about this one? Would you like to have different parents? How often do you have sex? Understand all of these questions, there's no black and white. You can come up with questions where there's black and white, but they don't ever couch those. They put them out in the classroom and you might say uh, three times and you'll say six times or whatever it is. There's no right, and so the, in the mind of our children it comes this way. There is no right or wrong. It's okay for them. They go, they want a family of four. I'm having a family of two. They want to have sex four times a week. You know, I'm having two. Oh, no. There's no right or wrong. It becomes right for you, fits your lifestyle, wrong for me, but I'm not going to judge. That's how we go. The teacher is to tell the child that he is to make up his own mind as to what values he will accept. Okay, so the values aren't to come from any parents, churches, any authorities. What they tell them is free your mind and what they, what they trying to say to the child is we're not pushing an agenda on you either we want you to think for yourselves but the whole program is run to make them think a certain way that's how it's going okay the child must publicly declare his conversion um, to the new value system and regularly act on these things they're forced to force fed the idea that if they even you know sometimes they have that idea from mum and dad and they have another idea um, that's been taught to them where it's, you know, maybe they say, okay, uh, this is wrong, abortion might be wrong, but someone else has had an abortion in the classroom. And it's right for them, they're young, whatever, that's how they think, so they're, they're in two conflicts of opinions. And the teachers will say to them, it's okay to be uh, in conflicts of two opinions. It's normal to have conflicts, there's no right or wrong. You can have two different things, no matter how different they are within you. So they can do that. Uh, so within, when they put that framework in the mind of a child, they're now defenceless against the true agenda of what they push through the system. And so things like uh, humanistic beliefs such as evolution, socialism, the normalcy of homosexuality, abortion, euthanasia of our old people, all these things, there's no right or wrong. We can then broach these subjects with no moral background to say of the sanctity of life or the sanctity of a child or anything on those lines. This is what teachers in North Carolina were told uh, of what values they should instill in their children in their classrooms. They were told this, seven point list, there's no right or wrong, only conditioned responses. Number two, the collective good is more important than the individual. Three, consensus is more important than principle. So if we all agree that it's okay, We'll go, you know, that's okay. That makes it right. So if we all agree that it's okay to put someone down when they hit 70 years of age, we're just going to take a bullet and shoot them through the head, like Hitler did for uh, old people and for, um, uh, for disabled people. He just euthanized them. If we all agree as a society that that's okay, then that's okay. That's what they teach them. There's no right or no wrong. We just agree it's all right. Um, flexibility is more important than accomplishment. So we don't need to accomplish things. Nothing is permanent except change. Here's another one, number six, crucial. All ethics are situational. It's okay to believe anything, but when a situation arises, we just make a concession. There's no right, there's nothing you really hold to. It all moves, you know. Uh, there's no moral absolutes. And there's another one. This is the sexualization. There's no perpetrators, only victims. Okay, so they say, um, say you have consensual sex. Uh, well... No one's a victim, so don't worry about it. But what if that is between a 50-year-old man and a four-year-old boy? But they say it's consensual. You think that's far out, but that's exactly what a pedophile said in the UK, and he was prepared to go to court over it. Um, and, what, and where do you go? If you don't believe in, in a moral absolute of any description, how do you defend that? How do you say that it's wrong? Maybe the four-year-old boy has been abused and he's mucked up in his head and, and, and the 50-year-old guy, they have an affection for one another. But it's still wrong, isn't it? He's abusing a child. But we've got nowhere to land on because there's no perpetrators, only victims. But that's a victimless crime because the four-year-old's not saying he's a victim at that stage. 
So we have politically correct textbooks. So even now in the American system, you've got textbooks that don't have the pilgrims in it. The pilgrims. I mean, you've got the American Indians. We all know the pilgrims went over first to settle. But they don't put the pilgrims in there, and they're all Christian, by the way. But they went over there, and they don't put the pilgrims in there. Why? Because they don't want to offend other people groups. So we've got tex historical textbooks that leave out the pilgrims because they don't want to offend anybody. America's also uh, uh, presented in an oppressive or negative light. Okay, it's a capitalistic country without equally critical assessments of other countries. And we're not saying that capitalism is best. The, the scripture doesn't say that. Uh, but you've got to be critical of the other systems before you hammer the other one. But their own textbooks are hammering their own systems. One history book uh, mentions the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Uh, what it leaves out, have a guess. The fact that they were Muslim. So there's nothing of that in there. Yeah, we've got terrorist attacks. Islam was presented as a fact in the history book. Islam, history, fact, fact, fact. When it comes to Judaism and Christianity, they couch it in these terms, in, in, in uh, an air of doubt. It's said that Moses received the Ten Commandments. Uh, it was believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but Islam is fact, fact, fact. Okay, that's how they present it. So in political co correctness land, there's no middle ground. And let me run you through these. Uh, I think you'll find rational people don't reside on either end of this spectrum. But there is no middle ground with a political correct society. So this is how it goes. Uh, as Les Parrott, he's an educator, he explains this. Quote, either you are, this is an educator, so he's a teacher, this is his call on it. Either you are pro-gay rights or you're homophobic. Either you are fighting for feminist causes or you're a chauvinist. One cannot oppose abortion on the basis of killing another human being. You can only oppose it because you're a sexist, opposed to women's rights and on the side of oppression. Homosexuality cannot be opposed on the grounds that it is condemned in the Bible or violates natural law. Those who oppose it do so because they're homophobic, morally oppressive and hate mongers. God cannot be called father because one adheres to the Bible. Those who refer to God as male are sexist. And that's where they're coming from. That's the, the, I mean, the, if you love homosexuals, tell them to stop because it shortens their lifespan by 20 years. That's what medical science tells you. It's ridiculous. You know what I mean? It's, if you love them, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. Uh, you know, anyway, we can go on. So what are our children being taught? Some schools' textbooks in the US favour Islam and denigrate Christianity. That's a taken. In some colleges, administrators or professors wouldn't allow students to give pro-American speeches on campuses after the 9-11 attacks of 2001. Why? Telling the students that America was the aggressor. Are you kidding me? On these campuses, the American flag was spoken of as divisive and not honoured. And I wonder in this country, when we have the Australian flag and it's denigrated, but we have the Aboriginal flag and we have the Torres Strait Islander flag. Now, my kids are Torres Strait Islanders, so nothing with identifying in that way. But the Australian flag is almost denigrated, isn't it? It's not held up in a place of honour. It's, um, you know, in disrespect and disregard. Uh, why? Because they don't want a patriot. What they want is a national, international citizen is what they're chasing. Okay, then he goes on and says, Marxist ideology, we're coming to a close, often dominates a college classrooms. David Horowitz said this, there are more Marxists on the faculties of American colleges than in the entire communist bloc. That's what he says. Their, their education, higher education things are Marxist, they're communist. That's what he's saying. This is what, listen to the lunacy here. A California teacher has been forbidden to show his students the Declaration of Independence. That's the founding document of their country. He can't show them. Think of the reason why. Because it mentions God in it. So they can't show them the actual Declaration of Independence that created their country as we know it today. But they couldn't show that. Why? Not because it was historical fact, because it's not the truth that they want to present. It's not the truth they want to present. They've got another agenda to cram down their neck. In fact, one judge, according to one judge, the Constitution is unconstitutional. Is he insane? He's sitting on the bench. The Constitution is unconstitutional. Okay. 
In many schools, the family is being redefined as a unit of two or more persons related either by birth or by choice, who may or may not live together, who try to meet each other's needs and share common goals and interests. Mate, that sounds to me like a stamp club. I don't know. I think we are all members of families. I think it's a lot deeper than that, don't you think? Um, what have we got? Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says this about, this is our commandment as parents. If you, we have children, this is our commandment. It says, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. You shall talk of them when you, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Listen, Ecclesiastes 11 says, As a tree falls, so shall it lay. Our children are falling. We've got to be involved. We've got to be involved. We've got to catch these kids before they fall too far. The mindset goes, uh, and I'm not saying, look, it doesn't guarantee Christianity. You know, you do your best to put uh, the word before them. You, I mean, you talk to any parent here. You pray, you, you read the word, you put the, the word in front of them. Ultimately, it's their choice. Okay? And it's a battle because the culture is against us. The school is against us. We have a society that is against Christianity. Don't think that it's neutral. It's not neutral. It's not neutral. We've got to, as parents, we've got to keep in touch with our kids. We've got to be more involved. And for some people, it will, maybe for some people out there, it's, it's homeschooling, right? You, you actually take them out while you can from the influence of the schools, you get in there. For other people, it'll be... Um, you know, private schools. Maybe it's the, the grammar or maybe it's uh, Christian schools. For other people, it'll be a public school. You get yourself, there's some good public schools out there still focused on education and all that sort of stuff. No problem. For each one, it's different. All we're saying as parents, we've got to be engaged with our kids. We're losing them and we're going to lose them. Why? Because we're too busy. We're too uh, wrapped up in our own little world to know what's going on. We don't know what they're being taught in our... We don't sit down at the end of the day and say, what have you, what have you been teaching? What have you been learning today? you know and, and challenge those arguments you know when they're shoving those arguments under their face just getting them to think about something different because they're not getting taught to think about other things you think about evolution I mean you can get those creation can you honestly say you look at Dawkins the head guy pushing atheism pushing uh, and what's his answer when he looks out he sees all the miracle of creation he knows it better than we do how the planets are just so aligned. Any closer the earth is to the sun, we become a burning mass. Any further away, we become a frozen planet. We're just in that thing. If we don't have the atmosphere around us to bounce off the radiation, mate, we're dead ducks before you get going. We don't have the moon to stabilise uh, and, and the rotation of the moon and the angle of the earth just at the right to create the seasons. You can't grow the crops without the seasons. You know, this it's balanced on a knife edge. If you get gravity and you string out a ruler from one into the universe to the other and you take and that's the measure of gravity every inch is just a measure of gravity if we take where gravity is set and you move it one inch one way then there's not enough gravity to form any heavy metals and everything floats out like hydrogen out of our atmosphere you move one inch the other way everything's too heavy metals no life can form we are and there's 28 of these constants Planck's constants they call them 28 of them we're balanced on a knife edge who put it on that knife edge? Because it doesn't happen by chance. You know what Dawkins' answer is? The backs of crystals. How did life tra get on the backs of crystals? You need to watch that film. I'm going to get free copies and give them away at the next Peter Danzi's thing. Expelled. Watch it. You think the education system's unbiased. People who have secular guys, not even Christians, that look at the evidence and say, man, there's... There's got to be more to this. They either come up with the attitude that there's alien life forms out there that have planted the seed. And what are you saying if you say that? You just put the problem back. Who created the alien life form? You know what I mean? Who created the hyper-intelligence that can come and seed this planet? We look at our watch. And I don't just say, my goodness, look at that. My God, it's a watch. I woke up this morning and it just formed on my hand here. Wow! Not only that, the time is accurate. And it just keeps bouncing along every minute. I look at my watch, I know there's a watchmaker. We look at the planet and we know <laughs> there is. There's arguments against, we're not defenceless against science. 
For, for thousands of years, Christianity and science has run like this. But in the last bit, they've gone like that, and they're telling our children that there's no other, there's, there's only one answer when there's not. Do you know that, let's take climate change, just, do you know that in 2008, 30,000 scientists tried to put Al Gore through the courts for false evidence based on climate, global warming? 30,000, but we sit in a room today, or you go through the state education system, it's not disputed, it's a fact, is that right? In fact, if you come out, like Trump's uh, environmental uh, thing, you come out and take a different stance, they all say, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. Now, I don't, there's, no, there's no doubt there's climate change, whether or not we can affect it, because the statistics are saying it's 10% it's uh, of 1%. Or 0.1 of 1%. How's that? I don't know. That's the difference we're making. That's what the evidence tells us. But that's not what they're telling us over the news. Is that right? That's not what they're telling us. So the education system is skewed away. I'm just saying there's other arguments. We need to learn to think. Learn to think. And as parents, we've got to be involved. Otherwise, your kids are just going to flow down this thing and think that what they've learned, that's true, that's true, that's true, because they've never challenged, they've never been exposed to anything different along the way. And God says this, the responsibility for telling them something different lies at your door and lies at my door. We are to bind this word and put it on the frontlets and sit, talk of it while we sit down in our lounge rooms, while we walk by the way. That's where we're supposed to be in general life. Just slip it in every now and again. The comment comes out. Just challenge that thing so that they can have it. We can't surrender the next generation to the state. Um, they give them the illusion of independence but end up believing a predetermined curriculum. I was heartbroken this week, and we'll finish up here. Uh, some of our neighbours, I'll change the name just in case it's recorded on the tape and they see it at some stage. And they had three boys when, they, when we were neighbours, and our kids used to play with their kids. Yeah, it's great. And uh, when the home broke, the mum and dad broke up, you know, they got a divorce. And, and obviously it's traumatic. The younger you are, the evidence will show you, the younger you are, the more traumatic a breakup is. And this poor kid, um, we'll call him John or Robert. Let's call him Robert. Um, he must have been under two years of age, I would think, when they split. Well, I did the return of uh, their sister, and I said, oh, how's... How's number one, number two, how's Robert going? And she said, um, well, yeah, good. Uh, it's now Roberta. This kid is primary age. I don't know, how old would he be? Do you, know, you know who I'm talking about? No. Don't know. T yeah, eight, something like that. And he's now a girl. And they're quite okay with that and they're accepting of that and and that's what I mean. If you, depending on your view, you will say this. Well, maybe, yeah, he's he's born a girl, and he should be. You know, we should do everything in our power to support him to be a girl. Well, that's not what the Bible says. Uh, you can no longer. In fact, there's been a court case where a baby was born, and they said uh, that's a boy. And then they got sued because you can't say it's a boy until they've decided they're a boy or a girl. We've got no gender value. You know, it's, it's a no absolute. It's ridiculous. I mean, and this poor kid can't get help though. How will he get help from a medical fraternity that is pushing the barrow, that there's no moral absolutes, that he is confused and he needs help to assimilate to become the thing that he was born biologically? Well, we understand there's struggles out there in this area, for sure, but they don't get that help. All they'll get is shoved down the, um, the Bruce Jenner <coughs> track, which he, according to the kids now, he's saying he wants to come back and be a man. Well, I don't know how they do that. Okay, I don't know how they do that, but I don't want to know. But he's obviously confused as well, right? Let, I say before we start playing around with our kids, let's start on the basis of what they were biologically born as and help them to feel comfortable in their own bodies. But our system will not do that. We need to be involved as parents because our children are being stolen from us with an education system which is heading down this road of not what is true, but what the state wants to be true. 
and they're pushing an agenda on you, your children and mine, and we're losing our next generation. It's no wonder that 90% of kids under the age of 25 are walking away from our churches thinking that when we stand up here and we talk about creation, we're on another planet, we're a bunch of dingbats, really it's all touchy-feely, it's a made-up thing. And, and, and the unfortunate thing is that we've got preachers in the pulpits that don't have a clue about the uh, historicity or the prophetic significance of scriptures to show kids that, hey, the Bible is true. Now, I'll say this about all of us, because we're all kids at one stage. In their kids is a heart of rebellion. They, it's hard, and in, when I'm saying in kids, I'm saying in all of God's kids. Everyone that's here, there's, it's hard to follow Jesus, okay? When I'm telling Marie at the back here, you need to forgive, mate, that cuts in you and me. You know what I mean? I've got to forgive my dad. I've got to forgive my mum. I've got to forgive my wife. She's got to forgive me. Mate, it's hard to be a Christian. Everything within you walks the other way. To be a Christian, you've really got to have the Holy Spirit bring you along God's way. And it's a road that's tough to be. But our children are walking away because they don't see Christianity as being relevant today. Why? Because everything that's betrayed in the media is, hey, they're bigots, they're fundamentalists, they're dangerous, they're not walking in step with the modern world. When the modern world is leaping off a precipice which is unprecedented in history, never, ever, ever in history have we said, we don't know whether you're a boy or a girl. There's always been cross-dressers. There's always been homosexuals. No problem with that. But now we've got 76 different genders. Are you kidding me? You've got a gender that you don't know what the gender is until they tell you what the gender is, and as soon as they tell you what the gender is, they can change that gender. Are you insane? Yes. But this is where we're heading off. And we're heading into a world with no moral absolutes, so why can't we splice a gene and put an ape into a human gene and make the ultimate soldier? Someone that, that's strong enough to carry a backpack that can feed a platoon. I don't know, how strong can you make it? But have enough brain to operate. Why are you stopping? They've already put rat's brain, put a bit of human brain in a rat. 1%. The rat was much smarter. Can you imagine a rat? Like you've seen the ones in South Africa. Mate, it's like a wombat. Forget about a rat. It's the size of a blue wombat. But with the intelligence of a human. We're going into areas that... Are, that God says we should never go into. He set up, you'll never see, I don't care what they say, you show me where an elephant has become an ant. <laughs> there's no crossing in the genomes, there's nothing, there's always been species that grow up. Yeah, you've got dogs, lots of dogs, we still talking about dogs this morning, small dogs, big dogs, but they're all dogs. Where's the donkey? No one says to me, I've got a Labrador, and I've got a Labradoodle, and they mated. And you know what we got? We had an owl. <laughs> no one says that. It's stupid. And there's no evidence of it. There's no crossing over here. But we're heading into these areas where we're beginning to cross them over. We don't know what's in there. Society has no absolutes. That's where we're growing up. Kids, we need to be getting into the Word. We need to get into Jesus. I'm not talking about some touchy-feely thing. God is a person. Jesus wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with me. It's not a bunch of rules. It's walking with a person through life. That's what it is. That's been my testimony. I tell you what, I got saved at 17. At 17 years of age, I was just cutting loose. We come from a family of good cutter losers. Man, my mum and my wife and my mum, uh, my mum and my sister used to go out and they were every weekend, raging on, you know. <laughs> the first time I got drunk, I was minding my niece. How's that? They went out to the clubs, left me in charge. Me and my mate, we he looked older than me. You know, we were both underage. He went down to the pub, got this cask of wine, big bottle of spirits. Mate, I got that drunk. I started. I was trying to pour the glasses and I was smashing the glasses in the drink. And this guy was a footballer and he said, Paul, you're really gonna, you're gonna put us in strife here. And he picked me up, oh, he must have been strong. He picked me up and he threw me over the kitchen bench. And I went over the kitchen bench and I landed in the lounge room. And that's where I lay, that was it, I was gone. I don't know what he did after that. In the morning, I thought we'll conceal this up. He tidied everything up, no problem. 
It looked a million dollars. They come home, I don't know, three in the morning from the nightclubs, all good. Next morning, though, I was as crook as a dog. I just couldn't hide it. Eh? I was spewing up everywhere. All things happened. They knew exactly what had gone on. That's the sort of family we'd come from. We were, mum was into witchcraft and all this sort of gear all happening on. That's where I'd come from. And when I got confronted with Jesus at 17, you know what I said? It got to a point where I knew it was true. I remember, I think I've told you this, I remember sitting in uh, the airport, Dad was an air traffic controller, and I'm sitting there with all these mates, they had all the porn magazines out in the back here, and they're a rough bunch of guys, right? And Dad had become a Christian, he's, he's uh, sitting there, and they, you know, they, I come in for work experience, you know? I thought, I'll go cruisy, I'll go with Dad. So, air traffic control, check it out. So I went and did my thing. While I'm there, they stood me up, dirty buggers. They said this, what do you think of your dad becoming a Christian? And at that stage, I'd seen a lot of uh, creation DVDs from cre creation science. I'd seen some Barry Smith stuff on prophecy and things along those lines. And I've got to tell you, inside of me, I knew it was true. But you know what I did? I threw him under the bus. I said, oh, I wouldn't believe that rubbish. You know, that's all right for him, but mate, no. <laughs> so I think it's a crock. And I sold him out in front of all his mates. And I said this. I said, God, I'm too young to be a Christian. I'm sacrificing my whole life here. I said, I watched my sister leave home, go out and have a whoopee time. You know, she was a heroin addict. She was, you know, sleeping around, doing all the bits and bobs and things like that. And I, I just assumed I'm going up and I, I'd be better than her. I'd keep it together. But I was ready to break loose, you know what I mean? This is my, this is my time. This is my... I said, I can't be born again now. I can't give my life to you because I'm giving everything. I, I need to have some fun first. I don't want to become a boring woman Christian. Just sit around, can't drink, can't smoke, can't fornicate around, can't muck around. I don't want to be that person. I'm only 17. I can't be that. That's how I felt. I'm just trying to be honest with you. But you know what I said? I said, I came to a point, I said, God, I'm just going to give you my life. I've got to surrender. I'm just going to give you my life. <coughs> I stood out in the front. One day, Dad invited me to church. He kept inviting me every weekend. Every weekend, every weekend, weekend. One day I said, I'll come. And when I come, the guy preached the gospel to me and I said, I'm going to do it. I just stepped out the front. I didn't know what the future held. And I thought, well, I guess I'll just be a boring old fuddy-duddy. You know, at 17. I look back now and I think how blessed my life has been. I didn't miss out on anything. One of my best mates committed suicide, died. Other guys drunk themselves into oblivion, smashed their marriages in pieces. God has stood with me through time and I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I've been blessed and I've been a happy man. I've avoided a lot of pitfalls. I've fallen in some of them. I've fallen in some of them. I'm not saying anything there. But God has been, it's been the best life I could have imagined. And you don't get saved because you want a better life. Because what awaits you is hell at the other end of things. Because you won't receive. I want to think, I'm just going to end with this. I know, end, end, end. I'm just like the Apostle Paul when he keeps saying that. And finally, finally. I'll end with this. This is what the gospel is. The gospel is this. We've all, the Bible says this, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. What's he talking about? Paul makes it a bit more clearer. He says, my righteousness is like a filthy menstrual rag. Okay, when we bring our works towards God and we say, hey, look at us, look how good we've been. He looks and says, are you kidding me? Ah! His righteous standard is so holy that we fall short every day, every single day. And it says the wages of sin is death. One day there's coming a reckoning. No one's nervous at the start, is that right? But when the day of an exam comes, you find out who's done the work and who's not. Those who have put in the preparation are prepared. Yeah, good. Uh, I think I went all right. I could answer one, two, three, four, five. You know, question 13 was a bit hard, but anyway... Those that have bludged all through the, the, the semester, they get in the exam, they said, oh, 
I couldn't answer one, two, three, four. I wrote my name on the top of the page and you know, find out there's a day of reckoning coming. God says this, eventually, at the end of your life, there'll be a day of accounting. It says, it was pointed to every man to die and then comes the judgment. When you stand before him at that day, he's going to say, even us, we're going to give account of every word that we've spoken. There's two choices. You're standing in a courtroom. You've got to think, you've got to marry together God's love and God's justice. Now, what would he be if God said this? Oh, look, I know you're a murderer. I know you've slept around. I know my word said that if you're a fornicator or a homosexual or a liar or a cheat, if you're that sort of person, you're not going to enter into heaven. I know my word said that, but I'm going to let you in anyway. What If a judge did that, we would say he's corrupt. Is that right? He'd be just barred from the bench. So you need justice. But God says that he is love, that he is mercy. How do we marry the two together? This is how we marry it together. We say this. We come into the courtroom and they read out the list of charges. This is what will happen at the end of the age. And they'll say, Paul, do you remember on, uh, what's today, 20, 29th? Remember the 30th, isn't it? On the 30th of July at uh, 12, 12 o'clock, you told this lie. Someone, a client rang you and you told your receptionist, I'm not here, that's a lie. You know what I mean? We did this, and then, uh, then you did this, and you cheated this bloke out of this amount of money, and you put this fraudulent tax claim through, and you did this, and whatever, you're, and I'll be standing there going, guilty, yeah, guilty. There's nowhere to hide. He's got it all. Imagine your life playing up on the video. This is you, right? Guilty guilty and you slept around here and you slept around there and yeah you told this lie and then uh, and, yeah, and yeah yeah oh guilty 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 and he says at the end he says um now the penalty for that is eternal life without god we call it hell right in the bible that's what it calls it but he says what I did is because you were so hopeless and sold in sin and you can't help yourself, ever, all of us are lost. He said, I sent my son because the penalty I knew was going to be the penalty of sin is death. So I sent my son to pay the price on a cross in Calvary and he died to pay the penalty of your sin. Everything that you owe, everything bad that you've ever done, Paid in full. That's what it had written above the cross. Teltalistai. Teltalistai. Paid in full is what it means. When he said, it is finished. Teltalistai. Teltalistai. It is finished. Paid. What the world does is this. They stand in that courtroom and says, I'll pay it myself. I don't want Jesus. I don't want anything. I'm going to do it my way. Oh, Frank Sinatra. I'm going to do it my way. And they do it their way, and they say, I'll be with all my mates in hell. That's what they say. Is That's what you've heard all that, eh? I'm going to drink and smoke and fart and drink and smoke and sleep around and no problems here. I'll be with all my mates in hell. We'll have all time. That's not what hell's painted as in the Bible. And you can pay for your own sins and pay that price, but God sent his son so you don't have to pay that price. You never have to pay the price of your own sins because Jesus has paid it for you. All you've got to say is, Jesus, I'm sorry for the sins that I've done. I want to turn my life around and I want to follow you and I accept the price that you've paid. And on the basis of that faith, God will take you at your word and you've just substituted. The penalty he has paid He's a just judge. Shall not the judge of all the, right, all the world do right? He is, the penalty has been paid. The crime's been committed, the penalty's paid. He can now let you off and you can enter into heaven. Or you can pay for your own penalty and go to hell. That's not a recommended place to be. Which choice are you going to make today? Which choice are you going to make today? Are you going to say, I'm going to do it my way? And if you do that, I've got one word for you. I reckon you should drink, smoke, sleep around. Go for it. Because this life goes real quick. 
I'm 47 now, and in my mind, when I'm telling you about 17 years of age, I was right there. That seemed to me in that moment five years ago. I, I'm kidding you not, it just goes. I'm 47 now, I'm thinking, mate, I'll be 70 soon if I get there. It goes. So just enjoy yourself. Get out. Don't sit here. Get out. Do. Other than that, you say, God, I accept the penalty that you pay and I'm going to do my best in this life to live for you in gratitude for you paying a debt that I couldn't pay. And what was before me to pay that debt, you paid it and now I'm going to live a life of gratitude to give my life to you. That's what becoming a Christian is all about. And you can't do it by yourself. Jesus has to come and live in you, which sounds stupid, I know. But when you open your life to God, God does help you to live according to his word. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. We walk in the spirit, not trying to keep a bunch of rules. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning, and I pray, God, that you'll lead us by your spirit. God, challenge us in our thinking. God, where our thinking is not, not correct, where it's off. God, help us to be searching. If you said, if someone knocks on the door, hears you knocking, opens the door, you'll come in and sup with him, Lord. If you'll just seek the truth and open the door to Jesus and say, Lord, I want to come let us reason together. I'm not parking my brain at the door and I'm not accepting this just by faith on the whim of some word of some bloke. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to seek you out. I want to know whether this is true or it's a crock. And if you set your mind to that, God will meet you and God will draw you. And God, I pray right now for those that are sitting in that position, Lord, that you will draw them by your spirit into all truth, that they might see you for who you truly are and not who the churches portray you to be or not what's written in a magazine or what the preconception is, but God, who you truly are. Reveal yourself to us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen.